This podcast is going to have two parts. It's going to cover the background to all of the encryption uh, programs that I established in Australia with the United Nations SEAL program with the head of the UN SEAL program established in Australia, Mr Carlos Morea, and I had fostered international alliances with the John Hopkins institutions, KPMG internationally, and also SPIRUS, which stands for Spies R Us. It actually manufactures the encryption technologies called the Rosetta chip, which is used by NSA and CIA for high-level security. And also I had an alliance with uh, the federal government of Australia, as I had served as the federal science advisor to um, Honourable John Howard's party in 1995. And now I'm running my own uh, initiatives in terms of credibility for encryption, global encryption, certification authority being established for Australia and Asia with United Nations SEAL program with the top trusted institutions of healthcare, which also included the four health foundations of Australia, the Mental Health Foundation, the Heart Foundation, the Stroke Foundation and the Diabetes Institute. In order to put this together, um, all heads of governments and also the foundations and investors had signed confidentiality agreements with me that I was happy to share the um, information on how we could do this to win their trust and uh, then we would work cooperatively for doing this. So we had put together an unbeatable team. Um, in a following podcast, I will show segments of the ABC TV 730 report and the SBS Dateline program that aired on the same night showing my true story. And it seems unbelievable, but let me show you how it was all destroyed, given it embarrassment to our governments, embarrassment to all our investors, but more important, how devious the octopus really is, and it destroys innocent parties. And so there is a parallel between my story and Bill Hamilton's Inslaw story. He's patriotic to the United States. He's willing to work with governments and intelligence agencies, defence agencies and departments of justice and uh, all parties. Uh, if they can work ethically, that he will modify his software to meet all their needs. Um, but if an octopus gets hold of it and sees that there's great wealth to be made, or if it turns out that they can't control the information. And that's what this is really all about. It's about the control of information, knowledge, and being able to listen to all communications and transactions that are going on worldwide. So let's start the story. This is an overview of the beginnings of my story, 21 years of research to show that the octopus that destroyed Bill Hamilton's Inslaw company is really the same octopus that destroyed all my initiatives in Australia. I didn't realise it until I had uncovered that the company who was selling Inslaw's modified program software in Australia was Rupert Murdoch's company. And this is my story. So let's go through the journey. Uh, my Introduction, as always, is that my understanding of physics, advanced physics and maths and high-level advanced computing and signal processing um, is not as good as Michael Riconosciuto. He's actually a genius. I've spoken to him for 21 years and I thought I was smart until I met him, but I'm not. But this is really um, a summary of nature from the fathers of physics, Niels Bohr, Max Planck and Richard Feynman. And that really is that we can only really draw a tapestry of what nature really is if we analyse its behaviour. 
And uh, the mystery of physics, which is attractive for myself, is that sometimes you look at a photon and it behaves like a wave, and sometimes you look at a photon and it behaves like a particle. And true is same is true, of course, for uh, particles as well. And that's what makes life really interesting. However, it's not until you look at the behaviour of an octopus and over 21 years of insight that you start to see that it disguises itself and changes its nature whenever it knows that it's being observed. And so this is all about the five eyes. It's meant to be protecting us and it's meant to be a alliance between our countries. But really, are we really sharing information and are we all spying on each other? And I believe that the octopus is the six eye that really is spying on everyone. It has no allegiance to any country. And so Danny took the pieces, the threads that Michael Reconosciuto gave him, and he started to understand and gather evidence that substantiated his definition and understanding of the illegal activities of this octopus, and that's why he was murdered. What's important is, very few people know, is that Danny goes back to 1973, not 1990 and 91. He'd actually uncovered who was involved, really, in the Watergate scandal. And that's why his files are classified B1, Executive Order Classification, to protect the names from being released of the people and the sources that he had and the information. And I'm going to do that as a podcast to tell you what he did. But he also had uncovered through sources of intelligence that he was communicating, that the authorities were spying on him because they were worried that uh, he was speaking to somebody who knew many things about the octopus's activities. And he was under surveillance in 86 and 87. And of course, he's able to put all the pieces together. So, this is part of the story of following the evidence of Primus, but coming from Australia, from my story, which coincides and overlaps with Bill Hamilton, we had the same business partners, and it turns out Michael Reconosciuto, he's taken to me into a trust on the technologies of mass physics and technology changes that he's uh, made to enable the octopus to use the Primus software. And this is the part that I went through, is that I was having an investigation to expose a company, an R&D company that was owned by Rupert Murdoch, that did sell the Primus software to the Australian government, that had made threats against me and incited government parties to have me threatened so I wouldn't appear at a federal inquiry, given my knowledge of what they do. Instead of me appearing to give testimony for three volumes of work that I wrote on encryption and collaboration and all this area, they had the support of some government bureaucrats in the Victorian government to replace me and let that person, a person, a chairman of their organisation, sit in my place as their preferred expert and have never worked in medical hospitals, never worked in diagnostic imaging, no qualifications at all in physics or maths, and the clown that's sitting in front is the one that's been threatening us all. So, in 1998, I'm going to tell my story. I had joint ventures signed and endorsed by the Who's Who with the United Nations SEAL program, a partnership, the Australian Federal Government, full endorsements, and it was all destroyed by CIA's operation called Still Point. And this is part one of Still Point that I'll reveal to you. And it's taken me 21 years to get the evidence to present to you now. So in my journey, this is the chronology to 21 years, but today's talk is just about this one. A bogus prince from the Philippines appeared on TV making a pledge to of $1 billion to the United Nations SEAL program, and within 24 hours, 
the media had everything ready to go to destroy the integrity and reputations of everyone who's involved with that program and destroyed the whole program. So the part that's very important is it takes me 21 years to find the true evidence, but the media had it ready within 24 hours. So I believe that the whole thing was set up, that there were authorities in Australia who knew that this prince was appearing, he was bogus, and they allowed it to proceed, and the media had everything ready to go to destroy it. And it's a typical CIA sting, to destroy someone's credibility, question their trust, so that you cannot be trusted to represent encryption technologies and security used for banking, healthcare, government communications, telecommunications. The octopus wants to keep control that we all use their encryption technology so that they have the key. So let's look at this part here. So as I'm speaking to you, this is the story leading up to a federal privileges inquiry is launched by me. And it goes from 1999, 2000 to 2001, it gets uh, put in parliament, where I present in camera my evidence that Rupert Murdoch's company was actually undermining the whole program, Mr. Carlos Morea and myself, to have us removed so that their company would be the preferred supplier of encryption technologies to the government of Australia. So let's go through the journey. And remember, Rupert Murdoch's company has sold CIA's modified premise software to Australia. So let's begin with the credibility I served as the science policy advisor in 1995 with distinction to John Howard's Federal Liberal Party. In 1995, the newspapers, the front newspapers, and the attorney to the Senate, who asked permission to write a paper about me, called When Ethics Fail and Group Think Prevails. And that means it took someone like me to expose billions of dollars of R&D tax rods that were being exploited by Rupert Murdoch's company, The Worst Offender. That's not me saying it, that's the words of the chairman of the Industry Research and Development Tax Concession Committee writing letters to the Minister for Industry and Science that his company was the worst offender, had offended it multiple times and keeps doing it. And it was also being exploited by their banks, international banks, such as Bankers Trust and others, with hundreds of millions of dollars being invested to claim a research and development 150% tax return for taking no risk. It was a syndicated trust, no risk. They get the tax benefit, ripping the taxpayers off, take no risk, and their money's sitting there guaranteed. So it was a rot. So when the my name's on the front of the Australian Financial Review and the attorney to the, the clerk of the US, uh, Federal Senate comes to my office and asks permission, can he write a paper about how I did it? The answer is that I had credibility and knowledge on some very complex matters that involved Rupert Murdoch's company. So here it is. We have put together an alliance to launch, with the Federal Government of Australia's support, together with the top institutions, a United Nations secure electronic authentication link, known as SEAL, for trade between all countries worldwide and throughout Asia, with the hub of the servers being located in Australia. So it was a great win for Australia, and my company, with credibility, had brought together the, the top credibility to support it. So that's Carlos Morea on the right, and that's myself on the left. And this was being launched in the end of 1997 on TV. The groups that I brought with me, with Carlos, he had the credibility and links back to the World Health Organization. My emphasis was on healthcare trade, 
telemedicine, telemedical consultation, but also medical records that would be secure so that we could empower consumers and patients to have control of their own medical data and know that it's not being pried upon. But more important, it allows for doctors uh, and specialists to be able to provide services across regions, states and countries in a secure manner. And of course, people need to get paid for their services, so it needs the financial security in integrity to validate that the services have been done and done by qualified people. So my alliance was with John Hopkins Medicine, John Hopkins University, John Hopkins Applied Physics, the partnership that I signed and negotiated was with KPMG and with Spirus. Now the name Spirus still exists. It really stands for Spies Are Us. <laughs> so we have the European side and we've got the American side and I'm trying to bridge trust that we're not going to mandate for this link whose technology is used, that's the client's choice, but we will have some standards set up for the way that the communications and the link and the service can be provided uniformly as with the United Nations uh, trade development point. So, Spirus had the Rosetta chip and that's secure, had a rolling key as well at uh, top security that CIA, NSA use and DIA use. So I am trusted and I've had an alliance with the Americans for a long time. I've also worked with a lot of countries in Asia and also Europe, studied over there in Berlin. And so we're looking for something that's global of trust. And this is a business of trust. Um, I had a card that I was doing and I was setting up what was called Global View a global certification where the information that we're providing is endorsed by the top medical institutions and John Hopkins was the number one institution of trust worldwide recognised throughout Europe, Australia, Asia and America and so my alliance went with them went back to 1993. That's how far back it went before I became the science advisor to Honourable John Howard's Federal Liberal Party. I also had the four foundations, as I mentioned, Heart Foundation, Stroke Foundation, Mental Health Foundation and the International Diabetes Institute. And we were also beginning discussions with the Cancer um, Foundations and several others. Um, but the main part was whatever information we want consumers to use, we wanted to be trusted and endorsed and certified. So we needed to authenticate and certify that the information that consumers and patients are reading isn't junk on the internet, but it's actually credible information. I had two initiatives that I launched with ministers, and I'll show some videos of those segments uh, later on. Um, and one was called Vision of Information Enhanced uh, Wellbeing, which means that it was consumer-based health prevention information, certifiable, authenticated that it wasn't rubbish, it had been endorsed by the top medical groups and reviewed. The other one was a Centre for Information Enhanced Medicine, which was going to be looking at the diagnostic imaging side where we're using diagnostics. So my background is as a medical physicist, mathematician, computer programmer in advanced image and signal processing, and of course, encryption technologies. And this is a business of trust. So I've put together the highest levels of trust and endorsing it was the Federal Government of Australia. Because I'd worked as the science advisor to the Federal Government, Honourable Fran Bailey had her members which represented a regional area in the country and so we're looking at using some trials of this so that we can deliver services to rural communities which is very difficult to get services to so she fully endorsed and gave a lot of support. Also coming to the party to endorse this whole United Nations seal link was the Federal Minister for Trade who was also the Deputy Prime Minister Honourable Tim Fisher and he was endorsed with the Health Minister Michael Woolridge at the time, Honourable Michael Woolridge, and also Honourable 
John Howard. Also the Federal Treasurer, Honourable Peter Costello, was very supportive and we had funding to do some trials to demonstrate the proofs of concept, but it was going to open up trade with China, Asia and of course links across to Europe. But Australia had the opportunity to be the hub for the electronic certification and set up of the certification authorities. And we were going to set our certification up in a secure bunker um, with KPMG, who happened to be the auditors of John Hopkins as well. So that's the relationship that I had with KPMG together with John Hopkins. And also Spirus was trusted by John Hopkins because it's the research centre for CIA, NSA and FBI and encryption and security is paramount for the integrity of the links that we're trying to do. So it's a marriage in heaven, but it's years of work to bring it together. And so I'm representing a part, negotiating a partnership of trust. On the night of the launch on TV, a prince arrives his name was His Royal Highness Prince Haji Mohammed Al Al Sagoff Van Al Dick, and he made a stood up and made a pledge to donate one billion U.S. dollars to the UN Global Trade Point Network for the UN's global infrastructure for the SEAL program to support the poorer nations. And there's a big fanfare. There's applauds, and there's also TV there. And this is the part that's interesting. The TV was there, the cameras are there, everything's displaying it so that it's seen worldwide and seen by every government minister across Australia. And then the next morning, everyone knew that he was a fraud. The TV channels running a program they're interviewing his family in Queensland he's dumped his family he was some sort of uh, laborer so just called laborer he's being questioned again holding his passport in front of parliament I mean he's doing voluntary interviews with the media the next day for the and he stays at the hotel for over a week and he's come in with an entourage a group captain Air Force from uh, is is part of his uh, delegation team from the United uh, Kingdom. Behind him is this man, Jeff Moss, whose brother is Peter Moss, a merchant banker. And my research shows that Peter Moss was one of the witnesses called to the Costigan Royal Commission into the Painters and Dockers Union with money laundering, drugs and arms involving CIA with Nugenhan Bank as one of the witnesses. I've even got now court cases in the US where he's being charged, but it says that he's a merchant bank with links with intelligence and the World Bank. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So it turns out it was displayed as a complete fraud. It caused huge embarrassment to Carlos Morea, who was the head of the United Nations SEAL program in Melbourne, and it caused chaos for trying to keep the initiative going for months and months, and also everyone's questioning the credibility of everyone, and so our whole initiative eventually comes down. It just collapses. And all the hard work, all the investments over two years that were put into that where people had volunteered time, money, but more important, the potential that it had. But more important than that, there is two TV programs I'll show you that my Global Certification Authority, endorsed by the federal government and endorsed by the foundations with the support of John Hopkins and KPMG and Spiros, also got destroyed in the whole program because there was a octopus of greed where people could see the money and the dollars and they wanted to control who gets the encryption technologies, who gets the business, who gets to control it. So I was threatened as a witness. 
I couldn't attend to a federal parliament on the whole program that I had written for a year, three volumes of it. I'm the author of it. A government bureaucrat goes up with my work after the government signed confidentiality agreements that it wouldn't use it against me. And it actually tried to claim it as its own. Also, the chairman of the research centre owned by Rupert Murdoch appears up there too, proposing that they've got better initiatives with their private companies to provide encryption technologies and expertise in these areas. And yet the man talking has never worked in a hospital, isn't a qualified medical physicist or a scientist, is really nothing to do with what we're talking about. So let's go one step further. I uncover the allegations. So Carlos Moreira is called back to Geneva and faces a General Assembly inquiry this is the report of 29th September 1999. I'm just launching a federal parliamentary inquiry and I'm advised that they've just released the findings of their investigation into the matter that had caused embarrassment by the prince appearing to cause embarrassment. And here it is. Talks about the prince. Did not prove to be authentic but the lure of global electronics had taken hold. And so, Prince of the Sultan of Borneo promised the responsible UNTAD director, the Melbourne Bay staff member, that he would contribute $1 billion. Their final summary is, and I made contact with the investigator. In 2000, when I'm in Parliament giving testimony to the Privileges Committee, I present my evidence that it involved Rupert Murdoch's company making threats against me and Carlos Morea. I have all the written correspondence that he was being pressured to work with Rupert Murdoch's company. He's told he wouldn't get anywhere with the Australian governments unless they run it for him. And they're the same group that had threatened me and that's what triggered the parliamentary inquiry. But more important, it destroys a whole program that had been endorsed by Fran Bailey, Deputy Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Federal Minister for Health, our Treasurer. It was going to be a trade, electronic trade commerce business to employ our brilliant programmers and developers and services which open up for trade in finance and in technologies and particularly healthcare providing health care to the region, to our poorer countries, with our aid funding to provide services. And then, in 2001, as I'm finishing the Privileges Committee, presenting my evidence, I find a legal case in the USA. CIA operatives were money laundering Russian gold bullion and US security notes involving the Prince Haji Mod Al Sagaf and Altic from the Philippines, but it started in March 1997. He appeared in November, so they were already dealing with him six months earlier. This court case had a judgment of $58 million of damages in favour of an Austrian investor who was being defrauded by CIA agents laundering hundreds of millions of dollars. Let me rephrase that. Hundreds of billions of dollars of gold bullion from Russia, China, Japan, and US security notes from Thailand, Brazil. So let me go through this with you. This is the court case, and there were four or five CIA agents who were linked to G7, G9 governmental meetings, and presidential advisors to the United States, claiming they worked for CIA and reported directly to George Tenet the CIA director. 
Now, what's important about this, no one went to prison. A fine of damages was awarded and it's dropped, but threats were made against people to testify, who were going to testify. Here's the case component, he's only one of the pieces involving the prince and saying that they met with him in March 1997 at the Western Plaza Hotel in Manila, Philippines. It names the people involved meeting with the Prince Haji with the security notes that they're trading with him. And again in May 1997, he was asking for communications with the CIA agents then the CIA agents were also identified in other cases worldwide, confirming that they were director of operations, worked with three presidents of the United States, served on committees, but involved in global finance with CIA. managing $330 billion, as you can see down here. But they're all reporting directly to the director of CIA for the purchase of gold. Bullion, US security notes. Here's another case. It's the same legal case. North Korean bank guarantees for $4.6 billion. CIA subordinates. High yield returns on investments. Now, this part's very important. I'll bring to your attention, in my second podcast, I will prove to you that this is with Robert Booth Nichols. It's a big program worldwide, and the prince was part of it, who came to Australia. So they were saying they were setting up humanitarian foundations with governments to help poor people. And that's what the Prince was wanting to do. But I have court cases from 2007 where Robert Booth Nichols is being questioned in court for his involvement with the Global Health Foundation in the UK with hundreds, a 250 billion US security note and he was working with John Ellis the cousin of George Bush so here's another one this is with the Russians the Russians were being defrauded by the same agents the same so-called CIA agents, promising huge returns, a secret CIA investment of high-yield secret government programs. And I'll prove to you in my second, second podcast other cases where the prince is involved and it's Promus. It's using Promus software with the Kuwait royal family. But this is what destroyed us in Australia. Here's another one, Austrian case. You're looking at huge quantities, high-ranking CIA promissory notes, communications and conspirators. No one got charged. See, keep this in mind. The numbers we're talking about are billions. It involves people who have direct links to George Tenet and presidents of the United States. And I will prove to you categorically these people with Robert Booth Nichols who were involved with this bogus prince who destroyed all of our credible programs in Australia was part of a CIA operation to shut us down but it's money laundering on a scale you've never seen and that's using the Promus software. And here's one in Thailand. and Vietnam and they're keeping the securities on a US Navy base in Thailand and the evidence I'm showing you is consistent with the octopus using the Navy base in Kuwait for the shipment of arms 
and heroin to the USA and to Australia. And so, here's another one. Bulgarian government. The banks, the transactions linked back to humanitarian pro, uh, foundations all being set up for money laundering. It's drugs. It's gold bullion between countries. It's money laundering on a billion dollar scale involving the bogus prince. Korea, South Africa, Four billion six hundred forty five million securities. This is Project Hammer. This is Promus. Danny was meeting with Chuck Hayes. Chuck Hayes was exposing Project Hammer, and so was General Earl Cocky, who was the representative of Nugenham Bank for the Washington office made a declaration in 2000. In 2000, he declared that this was being done with the World Bank and with Citibank by CIA moving hundreds of billions of dollars of gold bullion and securities and laundering through all the banks. And that's what triggered the RCMP investigation on US soil and they went to see Michael in prison, Michael Reconnoisseur in prison, and then went immediately to see the daughter of Albert V. Caron, personal friend of William Colby, William Casey, Michael Hand, and of course a made man in the Gambino, as he was the bag man for the movement of funds with Nugenham Bank and BCCI. It was using the Promus software and laundering all of the drugs and illegal arms through the Royal Bank of Canada and the Imperial Bank of Canada, Canadian Imperial Bank. And that's what they were after, the bank accounts that Albert Caron had. And so, more here. Now we're in Brazil. Now this is one legal case, and they were dealing with our bogus prince in March and May before he appeared here in Australia. Now we've done our own research is that I have the correspondence because the question that we asked and I've asked continuously is how did the media have everything needed to expose the bogus prince within less than 24 hours to make a mockery of our whole United Nations SEAL program and destroy everything that had been done. They had everything, but the most important thing is this. No one ever asked the question, how could he get into the country with his delegation, passports, diplomatic passes, and stay in our country for over a week at the same hotel and he's a fraudster and he wasn't charged. And why is it that I've uncovered that it was a whole CIA operation? And that's because I believe that ASIO knew, the federal police knew, it was a big scam. And that's terrible because that destroyed a credible project that we had put together involving our federal ministers cabinet ministers, prime minister, federal minister for health, deputy minister, treasurer. But what about all the companies that invested all their money and time like mine did and the big guys, KPMG, myself, and so many other companies who wanted to be part of the program? Why would they destroy us? Why would they allow a CIA operation to run on our soil to destroy us? As I said, 
I shut down the biggest tax rort, saving the taxpayer $2 billion. It was on the front pages of the newspaper. There's more that I saved, and I only know why, and that's why the attorney of the Senate came to see me and speak to me quietly. He wanted to know if I knew what I really had done, and did anyone know what I had actually done? And I said, no, no one really understood, but I saved more. See, all the investors could have sued the government because the legislation was illegal. It was illegal to approve the R&D syndication programs and uh, applications, and it was illegal to reject them because the legislation instruments were not tabled. So there were no legislation instruments that to enforce. So everyone that missed out on the law on getting the grant could sue the government, and the taxpayers would lose more billions. And then all those that had been given it couldn't be stopped because, and couldn't be rejected because there aren't any instruments that could financial instruments. That's how much I know and the taxes that I saved the people of Australia. And this is the reward that we get, a CIA operation on our soil. I'm patriotic. Bill Hamilton's patriotic. This octopus intelligence Greed, corruption, money laundering, gold, fraudulent security notes, drugs and heroin. I mean, I'm going to prove in a podcast that CIA Octopus put $8 billion of cocaine in our country using the Ku Klux Klan. That's who they use to get their drugs through. The Ku Klux Klan to Australian kids the flooding of drugs. There's the credibility of what I had behind me. John Hopkins, number one trusted institution in the world, knew me. I'd been there multiple times. I sat in the office of the chief counsel to the board of trustees, making telephone calls to invite Fran Bailey to come across speaking directly to government officials I'm working with, speaking directly to all the CEOs and chairmen of investors that I have on the table to support the initiative. Hospitals, health foundations. I opened all the doors for meetings for them to meet with our prime ministers, deputy prime ministers, treasurers and cabinet ministers. KPMG, my partner, and they're the auditor of John Hopkins, who was defrauded by John Hopkins. Spirus is trusted by NSA CIA. June 2001, a copy of my passport is at the security gate of the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which is the official research centre for NSA, FBI, CIA, DIA. I met with their directors. Part two, I'm going to show you what they did to destroy me a second time and Carlos Morea because when we lost this initiative and it completely crashed, I went to Geneva to work with Carlos because we'd been destroyed by a CIA sting and so we wanted to do something credible in Geneva with the government of Geneva to help all countries worldwide. So the credibility, think about this, my podcast is for the Australian people. That sting destroyed all the hard work and credibility of everyone that was put on the table. Fran Bailey went to John Hopkins to visit them. I arranged that meeting with the chief counsel attorney to the Board of Trustees. You can't get any higher than the Board of Trustees. That's everyone. He is their attorney. He was intimately involved talking to everyone. And CIA had a sting operation to destroy us. And they're the research centre for CIA and NSA. Tim Fisher worked Diligently G to um, represent our rights to have trade with our neighbours and to help Australian businesses get a foot in the door to the e-commerce trading system. 
And have a look at the world now. The biggest companies in the world are Google. You know, it's just ridiculous. Amazon, it's electronic commerce. And we had a chance not only to become the hub for the transactions, but we could have been the hub also for services of education, online education and online healthcare to provide services during times like now. So that's the project we had. That was the project destroyed. They recalled Carlos Morea to Geneva to face a full General Assembly inquiry on the embarrassment that that bogus prince did to the whole program, live on TV, and then caused chaos for everyone who was part of the, the support and collaboration so that the whole initiatives all fell apart in Australia and the octopus and the companies like Rupert Murdoch's company who are steering themselves to have people like Carlos threatened and me threatened so that they can be the recipient of all government orders. That's what the octopus does and that's how it works. But CIA does that to its allies. We are an ally and they destroyed us. And so that's how I'll finish this part off. That's the bogus prince, the first time that he appears. I'm going to show you a journey where it goes all the way to the top to the presidents of the United States who know about this prince. That will be part two. And so we now have evidence that our initiative was destroyed by CIA Operation Steel Point with this bogus prince. Part two, I'm going to show you that that bogus prince was part of the processes for Promis being used to rebuild the economy of Kuwait after Saddam Hussein had stolen their gold bullion and our treasures and letters of support from the ambassador of Kuwait. And as you can recall my previous podcast, all roads lead to the Kuwait royal family for Danny Casalaro. And his girlfriend of four weeks is invited to stay with the Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Kuwait at the Watergate Hotel. I'm going to prove that when I follow the money and the court cases and the evidence, it all leads to the same ambassadors of Kuwait owning companies with Neil Bush and George Bush's senior and junior with their families. Now what do you think the chances are that all this gold bullion, all this money laundering transactions with these groups are the same people that own companies with them. Sounds like a conspiracy. As I said, the definition of conspiracy is organised crime. It's a criminal cartel called the Octopus. It was headed by Ted Shackley, but it goes to all the way to the top, to George Bush Sr., and his family. 